Well, today is Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. Easter is filled with uh, all kinds of traditions. If your family is like my family, we grew up with family traditions on Easter Sunday. Joel, can we pop that mic down just a little bit? It sounds a little hot to me. Thank you. Um, My family grew up with, with traditions on Easter. Here was our Easter tradition. First of all, Mom and Dad would buy us, uh, my twin brother and myself, they'd buy us a brand new suit every single year. And so you should have seen back in the 70s some of the suits that I wore. Uh, Leisure suits with flower shirts, all of it. I'm sure there's pictures that uh, we don't want to show. But they'd get us a new suit, my sister a new dress. And then on Easter morning, we would wake up and we would go to sunrise service. Our church had a sunrise service, and we go to sunrise service, and then after the sunrise service, we'd always go out to breakfast as a family. We'd go out to breakfast somewhere. Uh, they don't have a Bob Evans down here. We'd go out to, they have Bob Evans somewhere? We got the Bob Evans or someplace like that for breakfast, and then we would go back to our church for our regular service, and then we'd go home, and mom would fix a great big lunch. We love that, and at least that part of the tradition, Vicky's fixing a great big lunch today, I think so. And then somewhere in the midst of all of that, we got a basket filled with chocolate. We got a basket filled with Easter candy. Now, I'm sure you have some tradition. It might be completely different, but I'm sure there's some tradition that you have followed as a family. Well, the early church had Easter traditions as well. And one of the traditions that the early church had comes from the passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning. And so I want to jump to the end of the chapter in Luke chapter 24 and read verses 32 through 34. And I want us to see this tradition that the early church had and then maybe practice it just a little bit this morning. Luke 24 beginning in verse 32. They said to each other, two disciples, we'll introduce them to you in just a few moments. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn when he talked with us on the road and explained scripture to us? Obviously, they're talking about the risen Lord. Verse 33, and within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said... The Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Now, the the tradition of the early church is called the Paschal greeting. It's called the Easter acclamation. And here's what would happen as as two believers would encounter each other, either in a downtown setting or or walking along the road or somewhere, as two believers would, would encounter one another, the first one would look at the other and make this statement. He would say, he is risen. And the other would respond, he is risen indeed. That was the Peshaw greeting. That was the Easter exclamation. So I want us this morning to pretend like we're the early church, all right? And I'm going to be the very first person, and I'm going to greet you with the phrase, He is risen, and I want you to respond with, He is risen indeed. Are you ready? All right, you're my choir. Are you ready? He is risen. Man, are you guys good. Let's do it again. He is risen Now look at the person beside you and say, he is risen. risen. All right, there was a little bit of confusion. Who was going to do the the second one, right? Maybe we should have clarified that. Let's do it one more time together. He is risen. He risen He is risen indeed. That's what today's service is all about. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we've had a lot of emotion here today. A lot of music. A lot of celebration, a lot of happiness, a lot of noise. Lord, I pray right now that you would calm our hearts. Lord, as we open up your word, I pray that you would help us to be interested in what you have to say for us. Lord, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to listen. Lord, not to Brian, but Lord, I pray you'd help us to listen to your word. Help us to understand what's taking place in in this, one of my favorite Bible stories. 
not only to understand what's taking place, but, but to see how it really applies to our lives. Help us to realize today that, that many of us, the majority of us, are, are just like the two guys in this story. And, and we need an encounter with the risen Lord. Help us to realize this morning, Lord, whatever our situation is, how very much we need you. So Lord, help us not just to hear the story, but help us to, to, to hear the story and to see the story in the mirror of our own lives. And I pray that each and every one of us would realize how very much we need Jesus this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I think many of you would agree with me this morning when I say that life is a roller coaster. Does anybody else feel like you're on a roller coaster sometimes? That's the way I feel. Life is a series of ups, and shortly after the up, there's what? There's a hill that's going down. Life is a series of blessings. We receive blessings, and then shortly after the blessing, man, we are encumbered with a huge burden. Life is filled with moments of extreme happiness. And yet life is also filled with moments of profound sadness. That, that truth is perfectly illustrated here in Luke chapter 24 in the, in the lives or in this event that took place in the lives of two men that were traveling back from Jerusalem after the crucifixion. Of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to walk through this passage today. If you have your Bible, open it up. If not, we're going to put the verses on the screen. But I kind of want you to understand what's taking place and then let's apply it to our lives. I'm going to begin reading in Luke 24, beginning in verse 13. Now notice what it says. It says, that same day. Now let me remind you, Brad just read the first 12 verses which highlighted for us the resurrection of Jesus, how the ladies had went to the tomb early in the morning, found the tomb empty, had the conversation with the angel, raced back to tell the disciples, and Peter raced back to see the empty tomb. Well, that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself showed up and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. Now let me make a couple of introductory statements so we understand what's taking place. The event that we're reading today is only found in the Gospel of Luke. You won't find it in Matthew, you won't find it in Mark, you won't find it in John. Luke is the only one that records it. And as I mentioned, this event takes place on Resurrection Sunday, the day that Jesus had risen from the dead. And this event, what we're about to read, demonstrates for us the ministry of the resurrected Lord. Let me pause there and tell you what I mean. We know what Jesus' ministry was before he died. Before Jesus died, he walked around and he taught. He preached the kingdom of God. He healed. He pointed people towards God. But at times we sit back and say, okay, what is the ministry of Jesus now that he's died on the cross risen from the dead, if we're not careful, we think that Jesus' job is just to sit up in heaven by the heavenly Father, cross his arms, put his feet up, and wait for his time to return. And you and I need to realize that Jesus has a ministry today. And, and Jesus desires to work in your life and mine today. And we see that illustrated in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at. The first thing that I wrote in your notes, and I gave you a really simple outline in your uh, bulletin today, but the first thing I wrote is this, the death of Jesus produced heartache. Now, as we read this passage, it's probably Sunday around midday. For, for the Lord's followers, it had been an extremely difficult weekend. If you know much about the New Testament, the Jews, uh, the residents of Jerusalem were celebrating what was known as the Passover, and people would come from all over Israel, and Jerusalem would swell to some two million people during the Passover. 
What a joyous time they had come together to celebrate the Passover. But man, what a wild weekend it turned out to be. As we studied last week, Jesus came in on his triumphal entry and the crowds received him yelling out Hosanna, laying down palm leaves and there were all kinds of events that take place during that week and at the end of the week, Jesus was crucified. And these these followers of Jesus had, had followed him from the regions around the country and they had come into Jerusalem with so many hopes, with so many aspirations. This great weekend that they had planned, this three day vacation, turned into their worst nightmare. Here we find two individuals in the passage. One is named Cleopas. We didn't read it yet. In just a few moments, we'll read verse 18. He's identified as Cleopas. The identity of the other traveler is unknown. Some people think it might have been Cleopas' wife. Others think maybe it's Luke, and Luke is just remaining anonymous in the passage. We're not sure. But these two individuals were traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, quite frankly, we're not sure exactly where Emmaus is located today. The town doesn't exist. The Bible tells us that it was seven miles from Jerusalem. And so remember, there were no planes, trains, or automobiles. And so these guys were traveling back from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And so what were they doing? They were walking. And as they were walking, they began to discuss the events of the weekend. And I imagine that their conversation went something like this. As they're walking together, the one turns to the other and says, hey, by the way, how was your roasted lamb over the weekend? The other one says, man, my roasted lamb was delicious. My mother-in-law made this carouset sauce that was to die for. But you know what? You don't brag on your mother-in-law too much, so I didn't tell her that much. Hey, did you watch the ball game? Yeah, Jerusalem lost again. When is Jerusalem going to have a winning team? Now, now I added that part. I don't don't know whether you saw it. I, I added that part. We don't know how their conversation began. But eventually their conversation turned to Jesus's death. And they were shocked by the events of the weekend. As a matter of fact, they felt as if their life would never be the same. And so as they're walking on this seven-mile trip, talking about everything that happened during the weekend, all of a sudden, a stranger approaches them. Now, now you and I have biblical 2020 hindsight, and we know that the stranger was none other than Jesus Christ. It was none other than the risen Lord. But, but for some reason, they didn't know that. The text says that, that God hid Jesus' identity. We're not sure exactly how he did that. As Jesus begins to walk with them, he pretends, Jesus pretends, as if he has no knowledge of everything that had transpired in Jerusalem the the last few days. These men are are incredulous. They look at Jesus thinking, not knowing who it was, and, and their statement basically is this, how could you not know what has taken place the last few days? In our day and age, we'd say, don't you watch the news? Don't you get on the internet? Don't you have one of those apps on your phone that that tells you when there's breaking news? These guys had, they looked at Jesus and they could not believe that he had no idea what was taking place. They look at him and basically say, why you're the only person for a hundred miles around that certainly has no idea what took place. And Jesus innocently looks at them and says, what things are you talking about? And so for the rest of their journey, these two men proceed to tell Jesus not only the details of everything that had taken place, but they begin to share with Jesus their own feelings. And they share with Jesus how they were hurt and how they were affected by Jesus' death. So let's continue reading. How were they affected? Notice verse 17. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. Let me pause there. Evidently their grief was noticeable because immediately 
Jesus asked them, what in the world are you talking about? What causes you to look so defeated? Verse 18 says this, Then one of them, Cleopas, who we identified just a few moments ago, replied, Why, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that has happened the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. Verse 19, the things that happened to Jesus. The man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they said, and they crucified him. Now, in order for us to understand the pain, we must understand Israel's national condition. You see, Israel as a nation was depressed. Israel as a nation was saddened. They had now been under Roman oppression for several years. And for more than 400 years, they had not heard from God. There had been no prophetic word, no miracles, not one signal to prove that God was still with them. And the children of Israel began to question, God, have you forgotten about us? We're your people. Why, we're the apple of your eye. God, have you forgotten about us? And all of a sudden, this man named Jesus appears on the scene. Out of nowhere, Jesus showed up. At first, people merely watched and listened to him. But soon, the crowds began to grow. And they began to follow him from place to place. Why, his, his teaching fascinated people. Why, they'd never heard anyone teach like that before. And my, oh my, then there were the miracles. Why, why cripples walked Blind people who had never seen before re recoup their sight. And man, what about those people that were dead that Jesus raised to life? This man, Jesus, was something special. He was powerful in actions and he was powerful in words. Why? This is just what Israel needed. But without warning, all of a sudden, Jesus was arrested there in Jerusalem. He was judged as a cr common criminal on a cruel cross. And as these guys made their way home, they were saddened because they had thought that Jesus was the Messiah. Notice verses 22. Then they say on top of all of that, or, or excuse me, verse 21, we had hoped, they said, that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened in three days. You see, they were, the disciples were saddened. The disciples also were discouraged. Can, can you sense the dejection in their voices? We had hoped that this was the Messiah. As we had already mentioned in the beginning, people looked upon Jesus with suspicion and doubt, but the more they heard him, the more they were convinced that there was something special about him, that he was more than a prophet. And then when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the colt, and then as those people began swarthing around him and crying out, Hosanna, these two guys at least were convinced. This was the Messiah. These guys had participated in the celebration, crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. But in just one day, their hopes were reduced to ashes. The, the, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I would like to think that these guys were guys that, that, that as they observed the events of the weekend, that they, they made their way to Golgotha, and they saw Jesus dying on the cross. The Bible wasn't sure. Maybe they stood there at the foot of the cross waiting for a miracle. He saved others, they said. Certainly he can save himself. But it never happened. And Jesus was dead. And Jesus was buried. They now returned to Emmaus with their hopes dashed. 
But that wasn't all. Look at verse 22. Then they said, on top of all of that, some women from our group of of his followers went to his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said that his body was missing, and they had seen angels who, who told them that Jesus was alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women said. Can you sense the confusion? (laughs) And we don't have a clue what's going on. I mean, this Jesus that we'd put our hopes and trust in died and he was buried and, man, I don't know. Now there's some report that the tomb is empty. When those ladies arrived at the tomb, the stone was moved and the body was gone. Man, we, we just can't figure out what's taking place. Can you detect their frustration? As I read this, and and quite frankly, this is one of my favorite Bible stories, I'm reminded of of several phrases that we use on a regular basis. I'm reminded of the phrase, man, when it rains, it pours. Can you imagine them thinking that? Man, this Jesus was crucified, and man, he was buried. Our hopes are dashed, and, and now somebody stole the body. What in the world is going on when it rains? horse. Their spiritual leader had been arrested. He had been condemned as a criminal. He was killed on a Roman cross, and if that wasn't enough, now it seems as if somebody had stolen the body. These men's hearts were aching. Now, let me pause for a second, and, and I don't know many of you, so, so I don't know your lives, but I read that, and I think, man, what, what a perfect picture of our lives. As a pastor, I I minister to aching people all the time. Minister minister to people whose whose lives are turned upside down, who were on the top of the roller coaster, and now they find themselves on the bottom of the roller coaster. People who come in and say, man, Pastor Brian, I, I just got a new job, and the job was working out wonderfully. And then the, the company closed down. And I lost my job, and now I just don't know what to do. We're speaking with ladies who say, Pastor Brian, my husband and I had a lifetime of plans ahead of us. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, my husband dies. Or couples who say, Pastor Brian, we've been waiting for years for a baby. And our baby's born. But there are serious complications. Yeah, yeah. Life has a way of throwing a curveball at us when we're expecting a fastball. Isn't that right? We're expecting life to be one way. We're expecting everything to be organized, and, and, and we have our life planned out, and we're going to raise our kids, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and all of a sudden, God allows a curveball to be thrown in our lives, and we begin to question How can we survive? How can we go on? And because of the events of our life, like these two guys, we're sad and beyond measure. We're discouraged. We've lost our joy. And on top of all of that, we're confused because we thought it was God that was blessing us. We thought it was God that was giving us all the blessings. And now this happens and we throw our arms up in the air and we say, where in the world is God anyways? and we're discouraged, and we're disheartened. I believe many of us can relate to these two guys. And by the way, let me just pause and say, if you sit back and say, "Uh uh-uh, Brian, not me, everything's going perfect, I can't relate to those guys as well, just wait. Because life has a way of happening. And when you least expect it, at times, problems, or even worse, tragedy, comes into our lives. How can we go on? Well, thankfully, Luke chapter 24 doesn't end with verse 24. The story goes on. These men were about to be ministered to by none other than Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord himself. The second main point that I put in my notes that's in your outline is this. The resurrection of Jesus produces 
hope. The resurrection of Jesus produces hope. What would Jesus' post-resurrection ministry look like? How, how would Jesus minister to two, these two guys that were confused, that were disheartened, and were dis- saddened, and were heading back to home, who knows, maybe to throw in the towel and say, you know what, man, I, that's it. I don't think I'm going to put my hopes in anybody else in the future. How would Jesus minister to these two guys? Well, these verses give us a glimpse, not only of how he ministered to Cleopas and his companion, but how Jesus ministers to us as well. Notice verse 25. Then, having heard all of this, Jesus just listened for a while. Having heard all of this, Jesus looked at them and said, you foolish people. Now, now I would have thought his first thought would have been, oh, I'm so sorry, and gave them a hug. Lay on my shoulder for just a second. Can I give you a piece of candy? Can I do something for you? But the first thing that Jesus says is, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these days before entering into glory? Jesus looks at them and says, wait a second, wait a second. What has happened wasn't an accident. You shouldn't be caught by surprise. Here's what I wrote in my notes. I wrote this, Jesus gives understanding to those who are confused. Let me say that again. Jesus gives understanding to those that are confused. He first of all reminds them that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. It wasn't a mistake. God didn't have to adjust his strategy. The game plan was always that Jesus would die. And then Jesus gives them the lesson of all lessons. It says Jesus, from the very beginning of the Bible, starting with Moses, through all the prophets, and told them all the scriptures that related to himself. And Jesus begins to preach to them, Jesus. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there. I always say I would have loved to have been a, uh, a fly on Cleopas's staff that day. And I would, have, I would have loved to listen to this message. You say, okay, Brian, what would Jesus have said? And obviously in, in this day and age with recorded messages and podcasts and everything, wouldn't it be great if we could download a podcast of this message? We can't, but we know the scriptures. And we know what Jesus most probably said. Let me, let me take you real quickly through what Jesus' message probably would have been. Most likely beginning all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15, immediately after the fall, God says this, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. A somewhat ambiguous passage in which immediately God prophesies that the devil would be defeated, that he would not win the ultimate victory. From there, he might have gone to Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15 that says, The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Maybe from there he went to Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Can you see Jesus beginning to relate everything there? Then maybe he went to Isaiah 53 and verse 5. But he was pierced for our rebellions, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. And maybe from there he went to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who has died. I sit back and think, wow, what a message that would have been. Jesus answered their questions. 
Jesus clarified their doubts. They now understood that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and that his empty tomb was a fulfillment of the prophecies concerning his resurrection. Here's what Jesus did. He gave them understanding in the midst of confusion. Let me pause for a second and say this. That's exactly what Jesus wants to do for you. If you're here today and you say, man, Brian, to me, life doesn't make sense. And on top of that, there's this religion and that religion. And man, I'm just being bombarded with all of that. And Brian, quite frankly, I am confused. I get it. Man, we're bombarded with all kinds of confusing messages. But here's what Jesus wants to do in my life and yours. Jesus desires to give us understanding in the midst of, of confusion. I wrote down two simple phrases in your outline. The first one is this, the Bible makes sense. I want you to catch that today. The Bible makes sense. There is a unity, there is a cohesion from the very beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It's not just a bunch of random stuff that don't seem to jive together. It all comes together. And that's what Jesus is saying from the very beginning, from Moses. He went back and showed them how all of those things work together. But but, but here's the other thing I want you to catch. The Bible not only makes sense, but I want you to catch this today. The Bible is about Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus, whether it's Old Testament books or whether it's New Testament books. And Jesus takes those Old Testament prophecies and he shows how all of those Old Testament prophecies pointed to whom? They pointed to him. The Bible is a book about Jesus. Last week we talked about 300 messianic prophecies that were given hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born that pointed to Jesus, pointing that he was the fulfillment of those prophecies. You see, Jesus' ministry today is to give you and I understanding. He gives understanding to those that are confused. Notice in verse 28 as we continue... Okay, so Jesus preaches this message to them. Verse 28, by the time, by this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going on. They come to Emmaus and the guys are saying, okay, here's our route. And Jesus is probably saying, hey, it's been real nice to meet you. And maybe we can catch up sometime. Maybe we can play a round of golf, something in the future. Jesus acts as if he is going on. Verse 29, but they begged him. Stay the night with us. Now remember, they still had no idea who this guy was. Stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home and stayed with them. Man, here's what I noticed. Okay, remember these guys were saddened, discouraged, and confused. All of a sudden, Jesus lifts the cloud of confusion. And and all of a sudden, these guys that are discouraged are, are no longer discouraged. As a matter of fact, they're actually enjoying being with Jesus. Now, all of us have been with people that we did not enjoy being with. As I read this, I was thinking years ago, I was, in, I was in Argentina on a missions trip, and we were taking a bus trip from Rosario to Buenos Aires, this four-hour bus trip, and the bus driver spoke incessantly. I mean, from the time we got in the bus until we left, and, 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 and I'm bilingual, so I can understand everything he said, I pretended as if I did not know anything. <laughs> All right, because after a few minutes, this guy was just driving me crazy. And by the time we got to Buenos Aires, I couldn't get out of the bus. I couldn't wait to get out of the bus. That's not the way these guys were. These guys were like, man, Jesus, come on, you don't have to leave. We've enjoyed being with you. Spend the night. You're not going to go on. It's dark outside. Where are you going to go? Come on in. I'm sure my wife won't mind. We got an extra room. Spend the night with us. What did Jesus do? Man, he lifted their spirits. As they left Jerusalem, they were sad and discouraged and without hope. But this man raised their spirits. His mere presence encouraged them. Hey, don't miss the application there. When you and I find ourselves discouraged, when you and I find ourselves depressed or even saddened, we need to realize that we are not alone. 
We have a divine traveler that, that accompanies us. He's with us. And his purpose is to give us joy. Jesus said this in John 15, 11, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. You see, God this morning desires to give us joy, unbelievable happiness in the person of Jesus Christ. So follow me today. What's the ministry of the resurrected Lord? His teaching gives us understanding in the midst of confusion. His presence gives us hope in the midst of desperation. But he does one other thing. Notice verse 30. All right, so Jesus acquiesced and spent the night with these guys. So verse 30 says this. So he went home with them, verse 29. Then verse 30. As they sat down to eat. Now catch what's taking place. Jesus took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Verse 31, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. <laughs> and at that moment, Jesus disappeared from them. Now, now, to understand what's taking place, you have to understand the customs of Jesus' day. In that day, as today, a guest would never take upon himself or herself the responsibilities of the host. You don't walk into somebody's house if they invite you for a meal and all of a sudden start directing things and say, okay, everybody come down and sit down at the table. Let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to lead you in prayer. You don't do that. Why? You're the guest. Why? Well, that would be a little obnoxious to do, would it not? The same thing was true in the Middle East during these times. And yet Jesus sits down in these guys' homes, and Jesus what? Jesus takes the bread, and Jesus blesses the bread, and he breaks it. And what does the text say? At that precise moment, they recognized him. The Bible says that their eyes were open. They recognized him, and they believed. Here's the last thing that I wrote down is this. Jesus gives faith to those who have no hope. Jesus gives faith. I want you to notice the response. Notice verse 32. We're coming to the end. Then they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road? The guy started saying, man, as he talked, there was something that was happening in my heart. Man, my heart, they didn't know how to describe it. My heart was burning with belief. My heart was burning with conviction. He said it. I believed it. Did you feel that way? And the other guy said, yeah, I felt the exact same way. His presence gave us faith. In the midst of desperation, in the midst of a lack of hope, Jesus came into their lives and he gave them faith. So much so that they picked up from where they were. And you know what they did? They went seven miles back to Jerusalem. Remember, no planes, no trains, no buses. They went seven miles back to Jerusalem and found the disciples. And here's what they said. We looked at this at the beginning. They said this, The Lord is risen. He is risen. Now, come on, we practiced that at the beginning of the service, okay? <laughs> Let me say it again. He is risen. He is risen. What happened? Jesus' presence increased their faith. I find it so interesting. Why would Jesus take the time to minister? to two unnamed disciples. Cleopas wasn't one of the 12. As far as we know, this is the only time that he's mentioned. He wasn't a man of importance. The other person is completely anonymous. We have no idea who this was. What does it demonstrate for me? It demonstrates that these two people were so important to Jesus that he ministered to them. Man, catch that today. Catch that today. Just as Cleopas was important 
to Jesus. You are important to Jesus. And just as he desired to minister in their lives, he desires to minister in your life. Jesus doesn't force his way in. Sometimes I, I speak with people about the gospel all the time, and they're like, well, you know what? If he was really God, why wouldn't he just come knock on my door and say, Here, who's what I, here's who I am, believe in me. Jesus doesn't force his way in. He doesn't. You know what he does? He waits till you have a need in your life. He waits till you have a crisis in your life. He waits till you feel like you are all alone. You're saddened. You're discouraged. You're confused. And here's Jesus saying, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. I want to minister to you. Let me minister to you. Here's the question today. Do you know the resurrected Lord? I'm not asking today, do you know about him? You can't live in, the, in our world today without knowing about Jesus. I'm asking, do you know him? He is a real person who desires to minister to you. He's a real person that desires to change your life. When you're saddened, he's there. When you're discouraged, he's there. When you're confused, he's there. And by the way, with these two guys, they were oblivious to it. Jesus had already paid the price for their sins. It was a done deal. Jesus had died on the cross for them. They didn't know it but he had died on the cross for them. And this morning, you might be here today and you might not understand the whys and the wherefores and the hows of the crucifixion and the resurrection. You know we celebrate it every year and it's something about Jesus dying and, and resurrecting from the dead. You might not understand all the specifics about it, but let me tell you this morning, he died for you. He died for you because he loves you. And what, what Resurrection Sunday is all about, the reason we celebrate it, and by the way, for the believer, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. The, we, the reason we celebrate it is because we've come to realize that we need Jesus in our lives. We need him. Do you know him? If you're here today, you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, what are you talking about? Do I got to sign on the dotted line? Is there something I got to pay? What do I got to do? No, no, it all begins with the decision of the hearts. It begins with a moment of faith where I sit back and realize, okay, first of all, I need Jesus because I'm not perfect. None of us are. Romans 3.10, there's nobody righteous, nobody perfect, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's, God's glory. We all need Jesus. Do you realize it yet? Have you come to a place in your life where you realize that you can't make it on your own? You need him. And when you realize it, he's there. And he's already done for you everything that you need done. By dying on the cross, he paid the price for all of your sins. And so your journey, your faith journey, begins when you sit back and you say, okay, I believe that. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. I can't make it on my own. I need you. And yeah, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, not just that he died on the cross, but I believe that he died on the cross for me. And by faith, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you help me be who you want me to be? And at that moment, God does a work of grace in your life and mine because we don't deserve it. We could never deserve it. He does a work of grace in our life and he gives us what we could never, ever deserve. He gives us forgiveness of sins. He gives us a new life and he gives us hope. Hope. The resurrection is all about hope. Do you have hope this morning? Do you know Jesus? That's what it's all about.
People ask me all the time, Brian, what's your job? Pastor, what's your job? I preach funerals. I, I do weddings. I do all of that. My job, very simply, is this. My job is to point you to Jesus. I'm a pointer. That's all I am. I'm a pointer. Do you know him? Have you given your life to Jesus?